Hello there. Have you fallen into an open manhole recently? Do you find yourself in the company of strangers? Well, then you might very well be in the feature underground. If you want to know a secret, my name is Hunter Lanier, and I bring with me this time a review of a brand new documentary, Beatles 64, which is set to come out on November 29th on Disney+. Plus. But first, do what you want to do and go where you're going to, but please remember before then to like and share the video because I won't be there with you. But if you do want me there with you, all you have to do is subscribe and to make sure that you never miss a video, hit the notification bell. These are words that go together well, some might say. I'm trying to bring a little good faith decorum and film literacy to YouTube. And all of these are easy ways to help the cause. Water break. Now, there are so many stories you can tell when it comes to the Beatles. Even if you just limit your scope to the six years they recorded albums together. Beatles 64, perhaps wisely, it limits its scope to the riotous arrival of the Beatles in America in February of 1964. While there are many interesting elements to their arrival and the months that followed, Beatles fans will know that perhaps the most consequential element is that they arrived in America just three months after the assassination of JFK in November of 63. The country is still in collective shock when these happy-go-lucky goofball savants from a place that's actually called Liverpool show up and get the mourning country to crack a collective smile. America created rock and roll, it shot over to England, and reflected back at us brighter and better than ever right when we needed it most. The prodigal son returned, and now there are four of them. In addition to the band's unintentional reanimation of an entire country, the documentary also covers the effect their arrival had on individuals from different demographics, and how a lot of the talking heads and adults of the time were trying to make sense of them. You also hear the present day testimonials of people of varying degrees of fame, David Lynch probably being the most interesting. Paul and Ringo themselves show up. Martin Scorsese, who also produces the movie, appears in, in the actual film to help guide Ringo through some old memories. But if you're a long time Beatles fan like I am, You've probably heard all of these stories before. Paul, for instance, tells the same story about his dad suggesting they change the lyrics to She Loves You, Yes, Yes, Yes. Ringo tells the same story about having to jump off the, the rotating drum kit in DC to turn the platform himself in the middle of a performance. George, who appears in an interview that was done uh, during the anthology series in the 1990s, he t once again tells that story of supposedly while the Beatles were on the Ed Sullivan show, there wasn't a single crime reported in America. I don't know if that's true. It sounds unlikely, but I, I, I always repeat that story as if it were true because as they say in The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, when the legend becomes fact, print the legend. So Beatles 64 isn't as revelatory as, say, Peter Jackson's Let It Be documentary, also on Disney+, Plus. nor is it as comprehensive as the anthology series, which, in my opinion, remains the go-to Beatles documentary. In fact, it's right up there. Why that hasn't been restored in 4K, I don't know. So even though Beatles 64 doesn't give fans anything new, if you're anything like me, you're attracted to these new official documentaries for one primary reason. And that primary reason is newly restored footage. And this movie has a lot of it, including a lot of footage that I don't think I've ever seen before. The footage I'm talking about is was recorded by Albert and David Maisels for a documentary that came out in 64. Naturally, that documentary didn't use all the footage, so there's, I don't know how many hours of just the Beatles 
in trains, in hotel rooms, just goofing around. It's as if you're watching deleted scenes from A Hard Day's Night. It's the Beatles before they were considered geniuses, before the drugs, before the introspection, before India, before there was any seriousness to them. They were just like four wrestling puppies. And with all of this footage that the documentary uses, it does a great job in making it so obvious why they were immediately beloved and leaving the music out of it. Being from Liverpool, a working class town, the four of them didn't have cushy upbringings, especially John and Ringo. And they took up music because they loved it and it happened to love them back, not because it was a means to an end. The music was the end. And in the end, no, I'm not going to say it, I promise. So when they got not just famous, but obscenely famous, obscenely quick, it didn't even really seem to affect them. It didn't go to their head. When they're interviewed, they give these famously smart-ass answers as if they're talking to a school principal. There's the famous interview at JFK Airport where a journalist asks them if they're planning on getting a haircut, and George responds, I had one yesterday. They're more concerned with making each other laugh than taking advantage of this newfound fame in some way or saying anything important. It's a startling difference between most people's relationship to fame today. There was something uniquely genuine about the Beatles. You could see it then, you can see it now, looking back, and you see it in their uncompromising musical journey thereafter. People always use the Rolling Stones as the prototypical rebel band, but, and I love the Rolling Stones, but they played a lot of catch up in their time. The Beatles were the iconoclasts. They never followed, they always led. That's true when recording Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, and it's true when they're playing with the documentary crew's camera and headphones after landing in America for the first time ever. There's also a bit in the documentary that I liked where they show an old interview of Little Richard. Little Richard is talking about Pat Boone's cover of Tutti Frutti, which turned this raucous lightning bolt of a rock song into a neutered novelty song. And then from that interview, it cuts to the Beatles rendition of Long Tall Sally. And it's just Paul McCartney ripping into the intro. Although the Beatles were masters, and then the step above master, which is subverter, they were masters and subverters of all genres. But their roots were firmly in rhythm and blues. And they were one of the rare white groups that could muster up that guttural soul. I would go so far as to say their covers of You Really Got a Hold On Me and Please Mr. Postman are better than the originals. This shows something about the Beatles that I think it's lost on a lot of casual fans or newer fans, which is that the Beatles were never a boy band. Not only did that not even, that concept didn't even exist back then, but when it did come into being, maybe starting with the monkeys, the whole point was superficially trying to recreate the Beatles' success. Pulling together four young photogenic guys isn't that hard, but that only guarantees, at best, a momentary success. Without the music behind it, there's no sustained success, much less success 50 years after the band splits up. I made the point in my review of Juror Number 2 that there is no such thing as a new Clint Eastwood, and there never will be. There never will be a new Beatles. Future generations will not have their Beatles. There is only the Beatles. In terms of the interviews in the documentary, they're pretty hit or miss. Like I said, Paul and Ringo tell a lot of the same stories. It's always good to see David Lynch in working order. The other people are varying degrees of famous and talk about the effect that the Beatles had on them when arriving in America. I wish the movie had made more of an effort to interview perhaps a, like a mosaic of non-famous people who could recall watching the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show or going to one of their live performances. I think hearing the stories of regular people from disparate backgrounds would have been more impactful than some of the people they decided to interview 
who seem a little too happy to be on camera talking about themselves. There's also one moment in this movie that rubbed me the wrong way. The interviewer actually asks Paul, what would you say to John and George if they were alive today? And you can tell there wasn't a lot of lead up to that question. And he was just fishing for an emotional response for the movie. Paul has been asked a variation on that question before, and I've seen him get emotional. And as a Beatles fan, it's hard not to also get emotional when he's talking about John and George. But in this movie, he just gives this quick, ready-made answer. And you can tell he's not really interested in discussing this with this whoever this is interviewing him. It's a, it's a great example of how important the interviewer is in these types of documentaries when it comes to getting the subjects comfortable and willing to open up. This brings me back to the gist of this review, which is that Beatles 64 is worth watching for the newly restored footage of the Beatles at their silliest, which hopefully finds its way into a better documentary someday. If you really want to get into the heart and the mind of the Beatles, again, I recommend the anthology series, um, Martin Scorsese's George Harrison documentary, Living in the Material World, is fantastic. I've already mentioned Peter Jackson's Let It Be. Paul McCartney did a Hulu series with Rick Rubin a few years ago, which is pretty cool because Paul McCartney is usually interviewed about the Beatles in regard to the mythos and the brotherhood. You don't get to see him dig into the craftsmanship very often. Well, those are all my thoughts. Now it's time for you to let me know your thoughts on my thoughts. Let me know if you're looking forward to seeing this documentary, if you'd even be willing to get Disney Plus just to watch it. I know that's a tall order for some people. Up next, I will be reviewing The Brutalist, and that video should be out around Thanksgiving. That's an American holiday, if you don't know. It commemorates, I believe, the first time that George Washington bred a chicken with a sandcastle. And until then, until we meet again, the word is that every day underground is a good day.